You are listening to the best in spoken word poetry on the Poets and Poetry radio show. The one who hurt to you. The draftsman of your sadness. He the indelible mark on a sky given its dimmest yet dark. Who let you down. Who watched you drown in the cruel cesspits stress pool who gave too little and took too much, who ruined such a perfect day, month, life, by not treating you like you have lungs that breathe and senses that might just wreathe your aching skin and the sore throb within. He is the soul that has everything to prove now. And now, how that aching heart needs the mind's emphatic claim that the one who burned you once would be the last to do it again. He who hurt you will never hurt you. Thank you very much. That was taken from your book, Binge Thinking. First off, how did you come up with that title? <laughs> oh, uh... I don't know, it just popped into my head. Yeah. Um, I said, it kind of does describe the approach I have to poetry. I, I, I kind of go on a roll where I rule yeah. the world for a couple of days and I yeah. think I can, nothing can stop me because I'm just doing it. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then I have a few days where I just don't write anything at all. And yeah. <laughs> so it's that constant thought process. Yeah, for, yeah. And, then I, and then the appetite disappears completely <laughs> for a bit and I yeah. do absolutely nothing. Um, so, but it do, it is suitable actually for the mm -hmm. book and for my poetry in general. Binge thinking, but it, it wasn't that way around. I mm. kind of I, the the words popped into my head, and then I realised after that it that it worked as a yeah. title. Um, so, where did the urge come for you to want to put a, together a collection of your poems and get them published? Yeah, well, it goes back to that. Uh, the thing I said about earlier, uh, actually scribbling them down in the first place on the train when I was sad and bored and just fed up, um, I started scribbling them and then you've got to, you know, started finishing them and then started showing them to other people, which I'd never ever done before. Um, but then you've kind of got to put them somewhere mm -hmm. <laughs> and other than the bin, which I'd previously done all my life. Um, yeah. So where do you put them? Um, and I think, I just thought having a book is a way of preserving them, really. Yeah. Um, I had a friend who'd uh, published, uh, self-published a book, um, and I thought, he's done that, and he's got his name on mm. that, and that na and his name will always be on that. Mm -hmm. Something to be proud of. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And even if nobody ever, ever reads it, um, your name is on it forever. Yeah. When I'm dead, it'll still be there on it's the shelf. It's a shelf. legacy. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, uh, you know, I've, I've met... An age where, and I've got two young kids, mm -hmm. and uh, they might be listening. Hello. Um, <laughs> what what am I going to show them? What can I? What can what can Daddy actually do? Yeah. Um, I, well, I, I could say I've done this this book. It might yeah. not be very good. Nobody might read it, but there it is. I did it. They can so, read it and enjoy it. Exactly. So yeah. there was that, and I wanted it just to sit on the shelf and with my name on it. So that was the first ambition. But mm -hmm. then you get the next ambition. You think, no, well, I'd like somebody to read it. And you think, well, your mum doesn't count. Yeah. Well, what you really want is for a stranger to read it. Yeah. Um, and that started to happen. Um, it's not a bestseller, but mm -hmm. strangers have read it. And yeah. Strangers have emailed me to say, I bought your book and I liked it. And that is good. That's just amazing. Yeah. Um, not in the millions, but who cares? I really, yeah. if it, one All person, feedback is great. Yeah, one person who's not related to you counts. <laughs> yeah. Because um, your mum would buy it anyway. In fact, <laughs> she wouldn't, you'd give it to her. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm joined by my special guest, Matt Chamberlain, who's gone now going to read a poem from his book, Love, Misery and Fruit Crumble. Over to you. Thank you. Well, having said earlier that I was mainly a melancholy poet, and having given you a couple of nuggets of misery, I'll, I'll switch now and give you um, a lighter, a lighter poem, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, this one is uh, a, a silly reminiscence about a particular uh, feature of a northern childhood. It's called Washing Our Hands. 
Before tea, when our nan used to say, wash your hands, we'd all undertake an elaborate bluff. But she'd see from ten paces we'd not done the deed, knowing we'd been upstairs nowhere near long enough. But we learned. And the next time this directive came, in the bathroom we loitered for appropriate while. That tap's not been on, she'd say, foiling our scheme. I listen to pipes, she would add with a smile. Thereafter we'd give a good blast on those taps. Washed them this time, we would triumphantly cry. Nay, if not, she'd retort. And how do I know? Because taps have been on, yet them hands is bone dry. After that we would all splash our hands in the water to leave Nan's suspicion no possible scope. But she still detected our failure to wash by finding upon us no odour of soap. A cursory dip of the hands in the suds, this gap in our ruse from now on we would plug. But the marks, which stayed steadfast upon all our hands, she'd expose with a famous long-suffering shrug. At last it was clear what we'd have to do if we were to meet all these complex demands. So we'd frantically rub at those stains with licked thumbs. Why on earth didn't we just wash our hands? Thank you very much. And that's taken from your book, Love, Misery and Fruit Crumble. First off, where did that title come from? <laughs> Same as the other one that came out of the sky, really. No, no, it was a bit more obvious, this one, because yeah. um, there was a lot of love in it and there was a lot of misery in it. Uh, the, the Fruit Crumble, there isn't any Fruit Crumble poems, <laughs> um, but it was just, it was meant to be like, love, misery and random stuff. Love, yeah. mi love misery and sublime, ridiculous. Uh, fruit Crumble just seemed to be... Yeah. <laughs> So, something worth saying. So as we come towards the end of the show, and this is a, this is a question I like to ask many of my guests. It's, I'm going to give the date today, it's Monday the 18th of April 2016, four months into the year. What can people expect from you in the future and what, what would you say your ambitions are, your creative ambitions, for not only for the rest of the year but for the next few years? Yeah. Well, the first thing is to finish the, the next book, as I said. Um, in per performing, I would like to do some different gigs. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also a bit reluctant to stop doing the ones yeah. <laughs> I've done before, because it's a bit of a... It's, I didn't mention the, the Medway scene where I do my stuff. I do some bits in London, but mainly in Medway, North Kent. Mm -hmm. um, and it's there's some really fabulous creative people there and, I, and, and it's been so encouraging and inspiring to me that yeah. I don't want to, it feels a bit like a little family um, and I don't want to stop doing that yeah. but I, of course I'd like to, you don't, nor, nor do you want to perform to the same audience, <laughs> the same stuff all the time, yeah. uh, nor do they want to keep hearing it, um, so I'd like to uh, find some other gigs. Yeah. I also um, want to do a couple of festivals Across the country or different parts well, of the world? I mean, what I really want to do is Glastonbury and Edinburgh, but <laughs> yeah. um, Edinburgh, I've got to do more work, sort of logistically and financially, because yeah. um, it takes it out of you, Edinburgh, I think. Um, I, and, and Glastonbury, I've got a lot of work to do to be good enough to get on that list. I've tried, I've yeah. applied twice, and it's... Uh, it's it's hard to get on there, but yeah. uh, that's the that's you you've got to have the ambition. That's um, very true. Uh, locally, there's a there's a festival in the summer um, in Kent, which I'm sort of possibly penciled in for, mm -hmm. um, but it's not quite finalised yet. But if that comes off, I'd like to do it. Um, there's a film, or there was going to be a film festival uh, in Medway, which um, I was going to curate a sort of poetry section mm -hmm. for that and screen poetic. Uh, poetry films and then mm -hmm. and then do a show at the end and unfortunately the organizer of it um, can't do it anymore but, okay. we, but we did talk about uh, sort of spinning it off into something else so we might salvage that okay um, that that's the sort of things I'd like to do immediately um, and more of the same yeah um, and the next the next book okay uh, they're, they're my immediate things okay so lastly where can people find more of Matt Chamberlain's work um, how can they connect with you well like everybody I live on the internet now yeah <laughs> um, 
I, I have a website. If uh, you Google, if you just Google Matt Chamberlain, you get a very famous drummer, and that's not yeah. that's not me. Um, <laughs> but if you Google Matt Chamberlain poetry, yeah. um, you'll you'll find my website, um, and from there you can find my Facebook and Twitter. Um, I, I won't read out the full um, website address because it's yeah. very long, but it's uh, but Matt Chamberlain poetry um, on Google, and uh, you'll you'll find it. Okay. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very, very much for having me. This has been the Poets and Poetry Radio Show. This is the Poets and Poetry Radio Show. Every Monday on Power Extra on Power Extra London. This is your hit music station.